a lot of responses to me on YouTube, which is great. That's the great thing about the internet in general, really, is that anyone can make their voice heard in theory, right? It's not, it's not actually true. You can make a video or blog post or whatever. It doesn't mean that people are actually going to see it. You have to either kind of get lucky with the algorithm. So your thumbnail, your title, or both are really popular. People click on the video. So YouTube keeps recommending the video to people and that can snowball and you can end up with a lot of views. You could get shouted out by like a larger channel or on Reddit or something, or you already have a large following to begin with. The response videos that I've seen regarding me generally have a lot of views and they come from like the same channels, channels that I've responded to in the past, Vegan Gains, Happy Healthy Vegan, uh, Mike the Vegan, but there are a lot of videos with less views and from smaller channels. And obviously just because a channel is small, just because a video hasn't reached a lot of people doesn't mean that it isn't worthwhile, right? I mean, I'm not perfect. I obviously make mistakes. So yeah, I don't know. I thought it'd be interesting to check out some of these videos and see if they're good, I guess. I do have some rules. Obviously, this is focused on vegan critics. So the channel, the person has to be vegan, right? I'm not going to be looking at like carnivore dudes who think vegetables are unhealthy. The channel needs to have at least a thousand subscribers and the video at least 1000 views. Also has to be a channel that I haven't engaged with before. And finally, there are a lot of videos. So if somebody is like misrepresenting me, making no effort to like fact check empirical claims or making obviously fallacious arguments, then I'll switch to the next YouTuber, three strikes, you're out type of thing. It's a little subjective, but I don't think you guys want to be subjected to that sort of thing, to videos like that. Um, and also I should be able to cover a lot more videos this way. First up is, so eating meat is vegan now? <laughs> I feel like I said that weird. Uh, by Tofu Goddess in the description, she writes, for the record, I understand that UV is just trying to help the vegan cause, but I think she's doing a lot of harm by promoting this view. Labels matter, words matter. So this is a response to two videos of mine, as well as um, some tweets as mine that refer to the videos. One video is on vegan cheetah and one is on Kalel. Vegan cheetah was regularly buying the chicken ramen, which has chicken in the flavoring only. And he was throwing away the flavoring packet and saying that because he was throwing away that it was still vegan. Kalel was occasionally buying a candy bar with a little bit of milk in it um, and saying that she was still vegan, but not perfect. She wasn't claiming that that action of buying the candy bar was vegan. So strike one, just from the title, I've never said that eating meat is vegan with the exception of cases where there's no option. Voluntarily eating meat is never a vegan action. What I have said is that the um, kind of labeling issue is a lot more nuanced. Labeling people, not the action, but a person as vegan or not vegan is a lot more nuanced. And that, number one, I don't personally care if someone who eats a candy bar once in a while or even meat once in a while calls themselves vegan or mostly vegan or 99% vegan, whatever. And number two, that I think there's a fairly good argument to make that this could actually be beneficial. I've talked about this in the past, that there could be a psychological benefit and ultimately a benefit in terms of consequences for animals when someone refers to themselves and thinks of themselves as a vegan versus just just a non-vegan. That when you do that, you have that cognitive dissonance if you do something like eat meat, right? You feel that like, oh, I shouldn't be doing this. And that could lead you to eat less meat than if you were or milk or whatever else than if you were just a like, oh, I'm just non-vegan, but yeah, I eat lots of plants, but I eat meat, like whatever. So yeah, I think a better title would be something like you can eat meat, but still call yourself vegan? question mark, unnatural, vegan, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, it would still be clickbait, but it's definitely more relevant than eating meat is vegan now. No, I've never said that. So there's a lot of stuff I'm going to skip. She has some silly claims about palm oil. That's not really 
not really a response to me, I guess kind of, but it's not really the point of her video. So as we can all clearly see, I'm sure, the vegan cheetah video that she made is very different from the Kalila video. In one video, she's saying that you cannot intentionally buy animal products and call yourself vegan because labels matter, and in the other video she's saying that you can intentionally eat animal products once in a while if it prevents you from eating a lot of animal products in the long term and still call yourself vegan. So in the beginning she says, I don't care how people identify us because we have this definition of vegan, so even if people are wrong about how they're identifying it doesn't matter because we have this definition. So it's actually okay for someone who eats meat to identify as vegan because this isn't going to confuse anyone. Okay is a really loaded term here. It suggests that there's nothing wrong with it, you know, that it's not inaccurate, uh, nor is it like a bad practice, something that's bad to do, which is not at all what I said. So strike two, I said that I don't care, as in like it's not a serious issue, not that it's okay. I've said the same thing about people buying like leather boots every few years. Obviously that action is bad at supporting a cruel industry, but it's just such a small thing compared to like food, right? Where you're talking about daily eating habits, often multiple times a day, eating meat, milk, cheese. I just don't think that we should be calling people out for buying leather shoes every few years. Meat clearly isn't vegan, so I don't think that, I just don't think that people are gonna think it's vegan just because a vegan does it. I think most people at this point are going to see it as like a lapse or a shortcoming, like, oh, you're vegan, but you ate meat. You identify as a vegan, but that thing that you did obviously wasn't vegan. I mean, look, non-vegans love pointing out <laughs> when we're doing something that isn't vegan. To me, that's like a kosher Jew eating a cheeseburger, right? I don't think that is going to confuse any chef or any company that's making kosher food into thinking that, oh, well, now cheeseburgers are kosher. So she's taking back what she said in her uh, vegan cheetah video where she doesn't want the definition of vegan to be watered down. Uh, she thinks we're at a stage right now where it's totally okay for people to identify as vegan while eating meat because she doesn't think this is going to confuse anyone. If you if you say it's okay to eat meat and enough people do that, then eventually the definition of vegan won't mean anything anymore. I just don't think that it's productive, you know, calling out people's mistakes if they're not making any explicit claims about something being vegan or not being vegan. Unlike somebody making a video saying that chicken ramen is vegan as long as you throw out the chicken packet, which is why I made that response. Like that, that is the core of veganism, not whether or not you eat the chicken packet, but whether or not you support the industry. And obviously buying that ramen is supporting the industry. At that point, the harm's already been done. You might as well just eat the stupid packet. I mean, not the wrapping, obviously. The powder. It's powder, right? Yeah. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> I mean, so much ramen. I don't even know if I ate the chicken flavor. I think I ate the oriental flavor, which depending on the brand has chicken or something in it. I would never just call someone out for buying the chicken robin, whether they use the packet or not, as long as they aren't making any sort of claims and saying that, hey, it's vegan, I didn't use it, right? The, the point of the video was to address that bad argument. Now, if it ever looks like this is becoming an issue, like people are going around referring to vegan as, you know, a meat diet or something, then yeah, obviously that would need to be addressed. But I don't think that's what's happening. If anything, we just have more and more and more and more articles from mainstream sources that correctly state what vegan is. There may be incorrect information regarding nutrition and all that sort of thing, but from all, even just like the worst <laughs> of the worst, like clickbait nonsense, they at least know what vegan is. Like this is important. Words have meaning. We're not at a stage right now where vegan is so widely known and that everyone knows what it is. Like we're a very small minority of people right now. I think if someone were to say, I'm a Christian, but I don't read the Bible, I don't believe in God, I don't pray, I don't go to church, whatever, we would say, no, you're clearly not a Christian. You sound like an atheist. First, I think we're pretty much there with veganism, but also there are actually Christian atheists. They do exist. If the purists had their way, then countries like the Netherlands, which are around 25% Catholic, would drop to barely over 6% of the population. Do we want that with veganism? 
kicking out possibly the vast majority from the club because they have cheat foods. My point is, you know, this is where I think the benefit of having more terms, these modifications to the term vegan, um, you know, comes into play. Like, you know, at home vegan or mostly vegan, 99% vegan. The same way we got useful terms, you know, modifications to vegetarian, lacto-ovo vegetarian, pescatarian, etc. They're all vegetarian without like actually being vegetarian. I said vegetarian a lot. Now it sounds like trash. Not a real word. It's a funny little semantic quirk, right? Like a category with a subcategory that has the, the same name as the category. You can be a type of vegetarian, but not be vegetarian proper. Language is crazy, but at the same time, I think that people can understand it because it's just not that uncommon. Particularly when a category contains diminished forms of an ideal, right? Like a Sunday Christian. What, what the hell is a Sunday Christian? <laughs> is that really a Christian? Anyway, I think that a, you know, at-home vegan can simultaneously be thought of as a type of vegan, like in the general sense, but also not a vegan. You can totally make the argument that the category should be like reduced terians instead of vegan. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know if that's a good argument. I don't know if it would catch on. I don't even know if it really matters. The point is that people will create new terms just by amending like current terms, existing concepts in order to modify, in order to moderate those existing concepts so that adopting that term or that label feels more doable. Vegan seems out of reach, but mostly vegan, at-home vegan, whatever, doesn't. And so now they have a name to put to that commitment. I don't think we should discourage that. Because people can be Christian atheists, then there are a lot more Christians. And maybe if people can be at-home vegans, maybe there'll be a lot more vegans. For Christians, this could be a big problem if the goal is salvation and if, you know, not believing in God 100% condemns someone to hell. But for veganism, where the goal is reducing animal suffering and not like purity, being mostly vegan really is doing the vast majority of the good of the work, right? So if having other terms that modify vegan and that aren't really vegan helps people to jump on board with that, I think that's definitely a win. And plus, it's just stupid to identify as vegan if you intentionally eat meat once a week. Which I think is obvious, so why do we need to point it out? What's not stupid is identifying as a six day a week vegan or a weekday vegan or an at home vegan or any number of other iterations that accurately describe the limitations or permissiveness that's being added to the label. Now regarding her tweet saying that we can't conflate vegan, being vegan with caring about animals, animal advocacy, unnatural vegan. Vegan saying that if you care about animals and you want to be morally consistent, you have to be vegan isn't alienating people. It's alienating all of the people who may not be ready to take such a big step. Going vegan is not the only thing they can do to move in that direction. Not changing their diets at all may be hypocritical, but any reduction is acting on those claimed values. It may not be as much as we would like, but it is something and something is not nothing. If people say, hey, I care about animals, you would be doing them a disservice if you didn't tell them to be going vegan because they presumably care about animals. I think it's Tofu Goddess who is doing them and not to mention the animals a disservice by misrepresenting action as all or nothing and likely presenting what many see as an insurmountable obstacle. How you actually help them, I think, is by being honest that every little bit helps. The more the better, obviously, but again, something is better than nothing. Giving people incremental options where they can do something and still be recognized for that and congratulated for it, I think makes a huge difference. Imagine you join an environmentalist group and one of those environmentalists bought a Hummer. They didn't have to buy that car, they could have bought any car they wanted, but they just bought a Hummer and they still identify as environmentalist. Would you want to work with this person? Going backwards is completely different, both from stagnating and from moving forward only a little bit. The environmentalist who just went out of their way to buy a Hummer for no reason, that would be like someone who grew up 
on an omnivorous, just a typical omnivorous diet, abandons that in favor of some really strict carnivore diet for no reason. An environmentalist failing to go vegan is not the same as moving backwards, which is what buying a Hummer would be or becoming a carnivore would be. It's the difference between change for the worse versus no change or change for the better in any degree, even a little bit. Environmentalists should definitely reduce their consumption of animal products. Not doing so would indicate hypocrisy, but not going all the way vegan doesn't. It sucks, but there may be things that are selfishly valued more than the environment, and that creates obstacles. Like an environmentalist who reduces their flights by taking fewer trips, but isn't willing to give up their bucket list of like seeing every country, visiting every country before they die. Any change or compromise is an indication of some level of value. And this person might still be a very effective voice, volunteer, whatever, despite not going all in. What does how you vote have to do with whether or not you're vegan? The definition of veganism only means that you avoid using animal products. It doesn't say anything about being proactive and helping the animals. Like you don't have to be an animal activist to be vegan. So I would agree with your sentiment that a liberal government is pro mo more likely to be sympathetic to uh, animal issues than a conservative government. But with that being said, you can still vote conservative or Trump or whoever and still be vegan. My point was the harm footprint, the consequences. Why would we go after someone who's occasionally consuming trace amounts of animal products, but we wouldn't go after someone who chose, you know, a package deal that included revoking animal welfare protections and pulling us out of climate deals. The reason obviously is purity. It's for people who care more about ideological purity than they do consequences. I know she made a response video to Vegan Gain saying how actually labels do matter, how like, it really does matter how people identify. If someone identifies as vegan, they will be more likely to make vegan um, choices than someone who identifies as a vegetarian. Identifying as vegan is meaningless if it's okay to eat meat and call yourself vegan. Again, I don't think people see it as okay. I think they see it as like a shortcoming, as like, oh yeah, you, you cheated, right? You're not supposed to eat meat. That was not a vegan thing to do. People who call themselves vegan know that when they eat meat, it's not vegan. And when they do so, they'll feel some amount of cognitive dissonance that clashes with their identity. I think they're more likely to eat fewer animal products and to do so less often than if they were compelled to abandon the label. My point was not that they are vegan, nor was it that it's, you know, fine for vegans to eat meat. My point was that maybe we shouldn't call the vegan police so readily because, you know, letting them hang on to that label in their own minds might help them do better. So finally, for this video, uh, Tofu Goddess makes this little diagram. She thinks I don't understand what a contradiction is, but in doing so, she reveals that she doesn't understand what a contradiction is. So that's fun. Obviously, identity can both matter and not matter in different ways, just like you can both be inside of a room and outside of a room by standing in the doorway. There are ways in which identity can matter a lot for people. It can help to guide their actions. But for other people, it doesn't matter if it's not technically 100% correct. So that's the first video. Tofu Goddess does have one strike left and she does have another uh, response to me. So let's check it out. It's called Freeganism When Vegans Eat Trash. The description she says, again, to be clear, I do not think you are a terrible person if you are freegan slash think freeganism is okay. This is just my opinion, not a hard fact. So obviously this is a response to my positive views on freeganism. She disagrees and tries to explain why eating meat is wrong in all cases, even if it's just going to waste. One of the problems I have with freeganism is what would that even look like politically? So with veganism, you know, we can go into schools and we can teach our children that animal products are not food, they're not healthy for us, and they're destructive for the environment. With freeganism, I, what would that even entail? That we can tell children that it's okay to go through the trash to find food to eat, that it's okay to eat strangers' food. Whereas with veganism, yes, we can all come together and say, no, 
this is not food, this is wrong, this is not something we should be consuming, this is not something we should be putting in our bodies. I don't know what she means by politically here, but um, I don't think that many freegans are advocating for freeganism to children or really to like mainstream audiences at all. It's a fringe thing that only a few people do and only a few people can do, right? There's only so much waste out there. Obviously, if a lot of people became freegans, we would run out of food at some point. And also, if veganism became mainstream, then freeganism would be obsolete because we wouldn't have much animal product waste. But in terms of teaching children, you know, you just have to be more precise that it's not the eating the food that's wrong. It's the buying and supporting the industry that's wrong, supply and demand. Obviously, this is hard for little kids to understand. I don't think I could explain that to my three-year-old, but older children should be able to get that pretty easily. There's reasons why I'm not going to consume animal products, even if I find them in the trash. And it has exactly to do with the fact that I want to be a better person. And I don't think that that's a bad thing. <laughs> I think that's a good thing to be concerned with being a good person. That's great, but I fail to see why that's better. She hasn't explained why not being freegan makes her a better person than someone who is freegan. The way a natural vegan seems to constantly talk about veganism is that she sees it as this big boycott, that all there is to veganism is a boycott. And this is really fairly common amongst vegans. The idea that we're all vegan because we want to participate in this boycott, it doesn't explain why you, viewer, do not ever cheat on your vegan diet. It doesn't explain why you don't cheat on your vegan diet in secret, maybe once a year, or maybe even just one time throughout your entire vegan life. Why don't you just order a vegan burger, an otherwise vegan burger, but with dairy cheese on it, just one time in your entire life? Is this action of buying this completely vegan burger except for the one slice of cheese, is this actually going to end up harming an animal? Potentially, yes. This is actually a common argument from anti-vegans. I actually could have included it, I think, in my 10 bad excuses video, but you know, I already had 10. I couldn't do 11. That would just be wrong. I understand that this is compelling, this denial that any individual animal product consumption or purchase has any ill effect, but it's, it's just bad. It's a bad argument. If a million people eat one fewer animal each, then that's a million lives saved. And each person shares one millionth of the credit of that impact, right? So each person on average saves one animal. We don't seem to have trouble understanding shared culpability when it comes to something like a stoning, right? Where a mob of people are murdering somebody, right? No one is innocent. Each person is responsible. No one person is responsible. So why do we have such a hard time when it comes to what we buy? and the consequences of what we buy. If you buy one package of bacon, that doesn't mean that the grocery store that you bought it from like automatically purchases one more package of bacon and that like, you know, one more pig is killed. Instead, there's a tipping point. If you buy a package of bacon, there is a certain probability that the, you know, manager of the butcher part, the meat person, whatever the hell you call those people, there's a certain probability that he or she will say, hey, we keep selling out of bacon early, maybe we should go ahead and order an extra case. And if you don't buy that bacon, there is a certain probability that the manager will say something like, hey, we're throwing out a lot of bacon, people aren't buying as much bacon anymore, maybe we should order one fewer case. It's a question of profit and loss, and profit margins in grocery stores are razor thin. Most grocery stores aren't run by infallible computer programs that keep track of all that, so there's also a probability of the manager noticing that they're selling out versus is throwing out more than is economical, but that ultimately fits into the probability too. What we're talking about is hundreds of people going vegan and ultimately one person being responsible for one fewer case of bacon being ordered. With every consumer action, we're talking about a small chance of making a much larger difference. The same is true of the stoning, right? There is a point in the stoning where one more rock made the difference between the person dying or not dying. If you're throwing rocks early on, you cause some bruising. If you're throwing rocks later on, the person's already gonna die from you know kidney failure or whatever due to the accumulated injury. There was one single rock that crossed that threshold from something the person could have lived from to something the person 
is going to die from. In either case, we're talking about a small chance of making a big difference. Now, obviously, we don't blame that one person, the person who threw the, the rock, right, for the murder and just leave, you know, everyone else is innocent. Everyone else who threw a rock is innocent. You know, there was no way to know ahead of time which rock would ultimately kill the person being stoned. In the same way, the vegan who acts as the tipping point to do something massive, like causing a company to shut down a factory farm because they've been in the red for too long, doesn't get all of the credit for the millions of lives saved. Because the actual effects are unknown, the credit or blame is shared, which means when you eat one fewer animal, you save one animal. Buying the slice of cheese may be a small harm because it's a very small share of the total harm, but you can't equate a small harm with no harm. It's still not the right thing to do. So why does Tofu Goddess do the right thing despite denying consequentialism? That's essentially what she's doing. Um, she gives some thought experiment where there's no harm at all, and then she asks, Why wouldn't you eat this piece of cheese? It's the same reason you shouldn't eat a piece of cheese that they accidentally give you on your order at a restaurant. It's the same reason you don't ever intentionally cheat on your vegan diet. It's because we all know that good people don't eat the corpses of enslaved beings, nor their bodily secretions. So yeah, she gives no reason at all because it's yucky, I guess, or because it feels wrong to her. If you do believe that all that matters is maximizing pleasure and minimizing suffering, and that's what makes you good, is minimizing suffering or maximizing pleasure, then you would have to say that a man who wins the lottery, let's say he wins $200 million and he gives 100 million of that to, or maybe even more, 150 million of that to charities who do a lot of great work and they improve the lives of, let's say, millions of people. Just the sheer amount of suffering that is reduced and pleasure that is maximized is huge. But this man himself, all he did was win the lottery and donated the money. Let's say now he just lives a life of indulgence. Let's not even say that. Let's just say he spends the rest of his life in his mother's basement playing video games. We would have to say that that man is better than a poor man who dedicates every single day of his life to improving his own community. And let's say that this poor man only ends up helping 10 people and he doesn't even manage to give them the amount of pleasure and happiness that the lottery winner managed to give other people by donating his money. If all that matters is reducing suffering, then you would have to say the lottery winner, that man is the better man. First, judging outcomes is not the same as judging character. The lottery winner caused better outcomes because he had more resources to do so. Character is about what you do with the resources you have and where you go from where you start out. I've talked about this before with respect to veganism and the moral baseline. Someone who grows up vegan and never moves on beyond that, never does anything better, never makes any changes for the better, is probably not as good of a person in character when compared to someone who grew up eating meat and then makes the decision and actually changes and becomes vegetarian. But even then, not necessarily you know, talking about people and whether or not people are good or bad is, is just really, really hard. And it's not really something I'm interested in. I'm much more interested in talking about actions. Second, no, I don't believe that pleasure is all that matters. Um, she later mentions happiness. So I'm not sure if she understands um, the distinction. Since she does mention happiness as being like equivalent to pleasure, I'll just take this as her not understanding the difference rather than her um, kind of misrepresenting what I believe, so I won't count that as a strike. There are utilitarians who believe in maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain, like Peter Singer. He used to be a negative utilitarian, but he's moved to positive, which usually goes the other way. Yeah, they're wrong. If that were true, if Peter Singer and others were right, then it would be the right thing to force people against their will to take some sort of pleasure pill that turns them into mindless zombies stuck in some chemical state of euphoria. That's not what most people want. And I think morality is about respecting people's preferences and all sentient beings preferences. And I'm not saying veganism is the end goal for ethics. It's just, it's a step forward to go from vegan to being freegan. Surely we can all see how that would be regression. Why it's regression. Why? Again, it's just the only explanation. She doesn't give an explanation. It's just this arbitrary assertion that good people don't eat corpses 
or secretions. She repeats it over and over through the rest of the video. Again, no explanation, no justification. It's circular reasoning and obviously strike three, even though the video is pretty much over anyway. <laughs> The third video is What the Health Debunked by a Natural Vegan by Those Annoying Vegans. Obviously, this is a response to my criticism of What the Health. I'm not a huge fan of that documentary. So if you guys aren't familiar with Unnatural Vegan, the first thing you should know is, is that, that she's vegan. She is vegan. But In fact, in this video, the first thing she does is clarify that because maybe there's something about the way she delivers her message that's a little confusing to mm -hmm. vegans and non-vegans alike. It probably opens her channel up to staunch non-vegans, perhaps. Because that would be interpreted as, oh, you're being objective. Right. You can't just agree with everything and what the health, because then you're jumping on a bandwagon. Well, it's nice that they aren't saying I'm not vegan, I guess. But then they suggest that I have some sort of, like, manipulative agenda, like I'm disagreeing with things and what the health for appearances. I disagree with factually wrong statements and I fear that vegans being dishonest is going to come back to bite us. I'm not going to say that the truth always wins and that peddlers of deception always get what's coming to them, but in the long term that seems to be usually the case. This probably should be a strike honestly, but I didn't make it one and they're my rules. I can break them if I want to. Don't judge me. This is kind of an ongoing uh, issue with her is the fat versus carbs. She seems to be very pro-fat and anti-carb. Yeah, at least that's what we're getting. And there's the first strike. Um, I'm not pro-fat. I'm not anti-carb. I'm anti-pseudoscience. And I'm pro people finding a diet that works for them. And I recognize that for some, eating lower fat helps them for others eating lower carb helps them and i want people to be able to find ways to do that on a vegan diet and it just happens that the pseudoscience in the vegan community is usually focused on fats and demonizing fats so that just that's what i usually talk about but i can't imagine that she likes oil i don't think that would make sense because oh, no. most vegans say stay away from oil as well because oil is very fatty. Yeah, oil is across the board not great for you. Strike two, no I'm not anti-oil and it's not across the board. Unsaturated oil is fine and can absolutely be a healthy part of a healthy diet. You can check out my response to Mike the Vegan for more info. And also like this, I don't know, they're making it seem like every vegan is like super super health conscious and like, I don't know, eating clean or something. Like there are plenty of e vegans who eat oil without even thinking about it. Even coconut oil, God forbid. She says he implies that a high carb diet is the diet he recommends. Yeah. But I never heard him say that. He I didn't just, say that. He just said that diabetes is not caused by a high carb diet. They never heard Barnard say it in the video because he didn't say it. And I never said he said it. I said it was implied. So Bernard is saying two things here and implying a third. So the first thing he's saying is that there is this uh, buildup of fat in the muscle and that this is what causes type 2 diabetes. The second thing he says is that this fat uh, is coming from animal products. And then the third, he's implying that a high carbohydrate diet is preferable. So strike three for not knowing what implies means. If you say explicitly that a high carb diet does not cause diabetes, then that implies that a high carb diet is better. Also, while Bernard doesn't say in the video that he promotes a high carb diet, he absolutely does promote a high carb, low fat diet elsewhere on you know his website, PCRM. In What the Health, he is defending the diet that he recommends. Um, I actually have a video about Bernard and my problems with his diet advice that you can check out if you're interested. Next up is Unnatural Vegan is a meat industry shill by Vegan Foot Soldier. <laughs> Don't worry, this goes by very quickly. Strike number one, obviously. I'm not a shill. I've never been paid by the meat or dairy or pork or beef or honey industry. <laughs> like, no. Although I don't normally jump on and hate other fellow vegans, I don't even think she is a fellow vegan. But she doesn't quote any studies, and the studies she does quote, if like once in a blue moon, 
A fucking nonsense. I don't cite studies, but the studies I do cite are nonsense. <laughs> Finally, we have Unnatural Vegan versus Dr. McDougal by High Carb Diabetic. He's responding to my criticism of Doug McDougal and his claim, um, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. He hasn't posted in a while, so I'm not sure if he uses YouTube anymore or if he any even still holds these views and follows like a high carb, low fat diet, but the criticism is still up and it fits the rules. So let's check it out. The first few minutes are mostly anecdotes, so I'm going to skip over that. The fat you eat is the fat that you wear, you know, um, when you eat more fat than you need, you'll wear it. So you do need fat, you know, for your body to create, you know, cholesterol and hormones, you know, it's uh, some fat is used in the creation of your cells. Did he just not watch my video at all? I want to start by acknowledging that McDougall is right in terms of uh, fat having a greater like propensity for weight gain in terms of calories because it is more calorie dense. Strike number one. And no, the fat in excess of what you need just to create cells and produce hormones does not become the fat you wear. Fat is also burnt for energy. Carbs may be more efficient in some ways and used preferentially, but you'll only wear these calories from carbs or fat if you consume more calories than you use. And no, excess carbs are not just burnt off. You can absolutely gain weight eating a high carb diet. It's impossible when you're eating sufficient calories to be deficient in fat. Uh, it doesn't happen. It's never seen. Strike two, because that's obviously not true. He even mentioned consuming flax seeds for omega-3s. I get, you know, uh, enough flax seed in my diet for omega-3. You don't need extra fat for energy any more than you need extra carbs. Either one can be used for fuel for your body. But unlike carbs, you do need essential fatty acids, and it's not impossible to consume a diet that is adequate in calories, but deficient in essential fatty acids. The reason it's rare that any sort of, you know, essential fatty acid deficiency is rare is because most people have the sense, usually due to kind of cultural trial and error, to eat some high fat foods more than just a tiny handful of nuts a day. And people like high carb diabetic have the sense to include some flax seeds in his diet and then turn around and pretend that they're unnecessary. Someone trying to follow this diet could easily construct one that could lead to deficiency and it's really irresponsible to claim otherwise. And the thing I want you to look at here, guys, is because studies are very good. You know, I think studies um, are very interesting. You can learn a lot from them. But what ultimately matters is results. He's saying to trust anecdotes over studies. You know, the thing is that you can't possibly know if a thing is getting results is resulting in another thing until you do a study. That's the point of studies. There are plenty of people claiming to have cured this or that disease and saying they've lost, you know, huge amounts of weight on meat-based diets, on keto diets. Anecdotes are just not credible evidence. Is what's being told to you, you know, um, does it does it match up or line up with, you know, logic or reason or understanding things that we know to be true? You know, the same as, you know, gravity is true, the same as, you know, the the high carb, low fat vegan diet is in terms of health, you know, um, you know, it's irrefutable. Comparing high carb, low fat to gravity in terms of being like irrefutable. That's a new one for me. I'll give him that. Look at a natural, a natural vegan. She's not, you know, she's not lean, is she? Strike number three, I have a normal BMI and yeah, what follows is just several minutes of fat shaming. I'll spare you the details. So that's it for now. Um, I have a list with uh, like a, a lot, a lot more videos, um, including the Vegan Lawyer, I think you guys asked me about. Also Goji Man, you guys asked me about. So those are on there. It'll be in an upcoming video or videos. I, I don't know. Depends on what you guys think about this one. If you like this, then I'll keep going. You know, let me, let me know. Hit the like button leave a comment. <laughs> I don't know. Why does that feel weird? I say subscribe. I say support me on Patreon, but hit the like but button, leave a comment. Leave a comment's fine, I guess, but there's something about, there's something about smash that like button. Like it just, I don't know. It just feels really weird, but yeah, leave a comment. 
Let me know if you like it. Maybe I'll pin a comment and you guys can just like it. And if there's lots of thumbs up, then then I'll do it. I don't know. You know, perpetual chemical euphoria. Euphoria. <laughs> They're all furries. Isn't that what we all want? Oh my god. I watched The Shape of Water. Man, I hated that movie, like, with a vengeance. And I, I mean, it's so not fair. It's dumb to, like, hate a movie like that unless there's just something vile about the, I don't know, the point of view or just if it's lazy, you know, whatever. I didn't even want to see it going in and I'm not sure why. I just, I just had a feeling it was not going to be good and it just wasn't. The music, number one, was, like, painfully over the top sappy and just everything was over the top the villains and just the whole just the whole thing man I hated it so much it just felt like Oscar bait and Michael Shannon I love Michael Shannon so much and there were some good you know uh kind of gory parts that Guillermo does in like every movie when he when he can you know that are cool because he likes that kind of stuff every once in a while and that was cool and you know Michael Shannon is terrific and Sally Hawkins was really good but I don't know I really love movies and I know it's silly but sometimes I just get I get really upset <laughs> when movies like that get so much acclaim and again when it's from a director and writer who I really like it just kind of you know, and it's not that it's out of the norm. Like, it's definitely a Guillermo movie. It's just got all of the, I guess it's so focused on all of the things that I don't like about his movies. What I perceive as like his weak points. Maybe that's what it is. The Lighthouse was pretty good. I really enjoyed that. We watched that recently. The ending wasn't my favorite thing, but man, I, it was great. Uh, Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson, they're amazing actors. The best movie I've seen in several years, I think, just in terms of it being like, wow, this was made for me. Uh, Black Coat's Daughter. Wow. It has, it's, it's has, man, I think it's in my top 10 movies. Like, I love it so much. It's incredible. And of course, his, um, his name is Oz Perkins, I think, the director. And he just did that uh, Hansel and Gretel, or I think it's called Gretel and Hansel, which I'm really excited about. I'm hoping that shows up on Google Play or whatever, you know, fairly soon. But yeah, that was on Hulu or Netflix. It might still be. So check it out if you haven't, if you're into cool, creepy, eerie, just, oh my God, there's one scene in particular. Oh, I love it. Oh my God. Such a great movie. You know what it is too? It felt like The Shape of Water, like it was trying to be Amelie. But like, no, <laughs> never. <laughs>